But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of this, your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and skin of water and gave it to Agar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot. For she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. As she sat opposite him, she lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, oh, lift your boy and hold him fast with your hands, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with the water, and the boy drank. And God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. At the time, Abimelech and Bukul, uh, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or in my posterity. But, I, but as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servant had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewes of lambs of the flock apart, and Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewes of lamb you have set apart? He said, these seven ewes, uh, these seven ewes lambs will take from my hands that, it, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba because, there were, because there both of them swore an oath. And they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol the commander of his armies rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a timorisk tree in Beersheba and called, called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. This is the word of God. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Oh Lord, we call upon you and ask that you might give ear to our prayer and that what we ask may be pledge our helplessness and our need of you. Lord, we are rebels at heart and our sin is always before us. But we have no hope apart from you. I ask, Lord, that you might make yourself known in each heart here today, that you would show us our failures, our weaknesses, our selfishness, our hardness. And I pray that your Spirit will convict us of our sin, convince us of your grace, empower us, Lord, to confess and repent and turn to you in desperation. Every household that's represented here today has its own unique challenges. Some are struggling with fear and doubt regarding any number of things. Some are attempting to sort through and resolve impersonal conflicts. 
Lord, some are in need of wisdom to help children or grandchildren. Some are facing uncertainties about jobs and practical provisions. Some are in pain physically. Some are dealing with emotional torment. I pray that you will reveal yourself personally, powerfully, effectively to each and every one. Bring healing and hope and peace that surpasses all human understanding. Lord, I pray today especially for our mission partner in Whispering Hope. Lord, we pray that you might meet all their needs. What a great service they are to so many. It's a blessing, Lord, for our community, our area, that this ministry that gives itself to unplanned, unexpected, sometimes unwanted pregnancies, the ministry that seeks to save life and provide practical assistance, a ministry that counsels with the gospel at the forefront. Every life that is preserved, Lord, proves the effort and the resources that are invested. We're grateful that we can support and stand with them. We pray that you will do miraculous things regarding our culture of death. We have devalued life in our heart, Lord, and our beliefs, our behaviors, it's impacting our culture in a devastating fashion. We've turned innocent life into nothing more than a political game. Our attitude of indifference is expanding. We're embracing euthanasia and violence, murder of all sorts and fashions. Life has become cheap. Our world desperately needs Christ. Make us faithful to proclaim the gospel. Lord, we can't address every need or opportunity that this world affords, but we can be faithful to the ones you put in our path each and every day. Make us aware. Make us available. Keep us faithful, Lord, to be your ambassador in each and every opportunity, to be willing to speak the gospel, to be willing to point them to you, the author and finisher of our faith. And we make this prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are in Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. I, can't, <clears throat> I cannot help but uh, think about Moses who was writing this as the children of Israel who had been liberated from bondage in Egypt were making their way toward the promised land. They are um, going through a lot of hardships and difficulty. And uh, as Moses is writing this book of beginnings, we've said that over and over. I hope, if anything, you take that away from this study in the book of Genesis. It is a book of beginnings. God began creation, spoke it into being. God began humanity, created in His image. We find that marriage began there as God has defined it. We find sin began, death came into the world through sin. And then we see the promise and fulfillment of God, this pattern that God displays for us and shows us over and over and over about His own character and ways. This particular chapter, I think, as Moses was writing this sometime after these events have taken place, and he's writing it for all of God's people, but primarily thinking about the nation of Israel, the people of Israel who are making their way to the promised land. And it's a hard thing. They're going through all kinds of challenges to their faith. They disobeyed, they were discouraged, they complained, they doubted, they murmured, they rebelled over and over again. But I think as Moses was writing this chapter, it made him smile. And I think that it would have made his people smile as he shared it with them. That God is faithful in all of his promises God is faithful, always faithful in all of His promises, and we should rejoice in it. 
Now, there are three distinct stories going on in this third chapter that seem like they could be handled separately, and they could. But there is a common thread running through them that kind of sews them together, and I want us to use that this morning to focus on all three of these together. They encourage us to marvel at and to rejoice in the Lord's faithfulness. So in the first seven verses, we see the long-awaited promise is fulfilled. We've been talking about this for how long? It seems like a long time to us. Imagine how it felt to Abraham and to Sarah. 25 years since they left Ur, since they left the land of his father to journey and follow God into the promised land. Finally, finally, the promise has arrived. So the long-awaited promise is fulfilled. We think about, we see pictures all the time. Many of you've got pictures in photo albums. You've got pictures on your social uh, media accounts of uh, birth taking place where mom and dad are gathered together with the new baby there in the room. And you know, they all carry the same imagery, don't they? There's all kinds of smiles and excitement. You can just see it uh, throughout the room. Mom is usually exhausted Dad looks like he's in over his head, but one thing is common. They're all just beaming with this glow of contentment and joy over this amazing thing that has taken place. Now, Genesis 21 is a little different. It's the same, but it's a little different. First time parents, first time parents, they're always fun to behold, but but these first-time parents are 99, 100 years old, and 90 years old. Now, you do the math. You think it through. You know, we see 25, 30-year-olds, 30 35-year-olds having children, some of them for the first time, and we know how exhausting and overwhelming it can be for them. Imagine being 100, Dad. A hundred. Some of you, you know, after six months, you feel like you're a hundred, right? The baby's not sleeping. Mom's not getting any sleep. Everybody's a little on edge. It feels like you might be a hundred. But imagine having your first child at a hundred and she's 90, 90 years old. Well, there are a couple of things front and center here in these first seven verses. First of all, we see that the promise had been made and is now fulfilled. Listen, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. The Lord did to Sarah as he had promised, at the time of which God had spoken. The emphasis is clearly on God's word and the believability, the trust that we should have that when God says it, it's going to take place. It's going to happen. You know, a doctor can estimate when a baby is going to arrive. They can tell you, here's the due date, and that's apt to shift and go in all kinds of different directions. They might even tell you by using the ultrasound what you can expect to have. Is it going to be a girl or is it going to be a boy? God came to Abraham and Sarah at 99 and 89 and said, next year at this time, you're going to have a baby boy and his name shall be Isaac. It's pretty specific, right? But just as God said, it has come to take place. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Listen, this goes back 25 years. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12 verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Genesis 13, 14 through 16. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you 
and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring shall also be counted. Genesis 15, 4 and 5, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Genesis 17, 16, I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Genesis 17, 19, God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Genesis 17, 21, but I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Genesis 18, verse 10, the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Genesis 18, 14, it's, it is anything too hard for the Lord at the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. But he said, no, you did laugh. 18 through 19 of that same chapter, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised them. Ten different passages, seven clear references to Isaac. For 25 years, God spoke these promises into Isaac's life, into Abram's life, sorry. It was a long time coming, but God kept his word. He fulfilled those promises exactly as he had offered them. The modern humanity has a difficult time trusting God. We have a difficult time trusting just about anything except ourselves. We're drive-through, high-speed internet, microwave, soundbite people. It's just who we are. So when God does things, God does things in his own time frame. He's not subject to time. Time is something God created for our well-being, whatever that may mean. But God is not controlled by time. It's a small portion of something, a, a drop of something that he holds in his hand that gives us boundaries and patterns in our own lives. So the first thing that we see here in these verses is that the promise was given, it was spelled out, and it has now been fulfilled just as God said. The second thing I want to draw your attention to in these verses is elation. There is this, this tone, this strong tone of elation piercing through these verses. There's a clear emphasis upon laughter. Laughter. We all like to laugh. We think it has... Uh, therapeutic impact upon our lives. We enjoy laughing, making each other laugh. Sarah says, God has made laughter for me. Now, she laughed before in derision, in mockery, in doubt when God gave the promise. And we can appreciate the doubt that she experienced. She's an old lady. And he's saying, you're going to become a mother. And she laughed with disbelief, but her disbelief has disappeared and is now turned to belief because God has proven. He has proven his word to be true. God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me, not in mockery, but in joy, in amazement, in wonder, marvel at this just as we're doing here today, some 3,500, 4,000 years after the fact. 
We're still talking about this amazing event. She's now overjoyed. How is this even possible? I want you to notice also that Isaac's name is mentioned specifically three times. What does Isaac mean? He laughs. He laughs. This is the name God said he will bear. So we see this this tone running through this passage of joy, of laughter, of elation, marveling at what God has done. A long-awaited promise. Through lots of trials and tribulations and difficulties and hardships and doubt and struggle and disbelief and lying and abandoning God. And yet through it all, God, because he is a covenant God, was faithful to them and now he has brought the promise to fulfillment for them and through them. And it's having an amazing impact upon them. The second thing I want you to see in verse, beginning in verse 8 is the internal threat that is removed. There is an internal threat that God removes here. The promised son arrives and it isn't long till conflict also arises. Listen, when God is at work, you can rest assured there's always going to be some sort of spiritual conflict to ensue. The enemy is persistent if he's nothing else. He may be a little on the dumb side when it comes to the things of God, but he is relentless in his efforts to oppose the things of God. And he begins immediately to stir things up. Isaac is weaned and they celebrate it with a party. Now, This would have probably put him at somewhere between one and three years of age as he's weaned and they have this great celebration. And we can imagine that Ishmael, he's no longer the the special uh, little infant to be doted upon. He's now been kind of pushed out of his prime situation and it's all focused on Isaac. So we can give him a little bit of latitude when we see that he's not at all happy about this and neither is his mother. He laughs, but his laughter is not like what we saw in the first seven verses. It's not joining in to the elation. It's a laughing of derision, of mockery. This is something that provoked Sarah. She saw it and she was provoked in her spirit by it. This laughter that we see coming from Isaac and from Hagar is like we've seen in other places. It's the same word that was used in Genesis 19, 14, when Lot went to warn his son-in-laws about the coming judgment. And the scripture says that they laughed at him. They mocked him. They didn't believe. They thought he was crazy, had lost his mind. It's used again in Genesis 39, 14. And 17, when we will study this later on, when Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of of making sport of her, of laughing and mocking at her, again, in derision, putting down. And then in Judges 16, 25, Samson, after he had been uh, rendered powerless and had his eyes gouged out, was brought before his captors and they brought him in to mock him. And to make sport of him and to amuse themselves with him. Paul tells us exactly what's taking place in this Genesis 21 passage. He says in Galatians 4 verses 29, He who was born according to the flesh, that is Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, Isaac. Abraham loved both boys. They're both his sons. Secretly, we have to believe that Abraham had this desire inside of him, this hope inside of him, that both of them would be able to coexist. Okay, God's made it clear. He's not going to bring his fulfilled prophecy through Ishmael, that that's not where the promise is coming. It's going to be through Isaac. But surely the two of them can coexist. I mean, let's face it. Abraham's already been through this with Lot, right? He had to separate from Lot. He had to have his family torn apart. And he saw all that Lot had to go through. In his mind, he's thinking, I, I want to keep my two boys together. I want to keep the family as dysfunctional as it may be. I want to keep them together. But there's a problem with that. You have one that's of the flesh and one that's of the spirit. 
in 1876 at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Countries were invited in from around the world to help celebrate the 100th birthday of the United States. The Japanese built a beautiful garden filled with plants from Japan to honor the United States and on its 100th birthday. The large leaves and aromatic blooms of one plant greatly appealed to American gardeners who desired to use it for ornamental purposes. This small and innocent introduction led to an explosion that no one could foresee. And even today, you see the remnants. You see the remnants of this poor decision. You'll find kudzu dominating the landscape, even here in Georgia, right? Craig, you know a thing or two about kudzu. You can't kill it, can you? You can't put it out of its misery or our misery. It's everywhere, and it's resilient. But it was here, it is here due to this tiny infusion. And the scripture talks about this. The scripture talks about a little leaven, leavens the whole lump, right? A little sin impacts the whole being. And so leaving Ishmael here within the household of this promise from God was going to end in disaster. It was going to be a huge stumbling block moving forward. God knows this, and he says, when Sarah puts up her fuss and says, I'm not going to have it, they can't coexist. Abraham pushes back, he's displeased, but God says, look, Sarah's right. Sarah's right. You need to remove them from the house. They cannot coexist in this place. It's going to be detrimental. And he goes further. He says, Hagar's son will be blessed and become a great nation. Don't worry about them. I will take care of them. Isn't this amazing? This amazing God, this gift, how gracious he is. The product of Abraham and Sarah's son of disbelief and doubt is Ishmael. And God, God could have just exterminated the whole lot right there, couldn't he? He could have put a lot of things to rest. But he says, I'm going to take care of him. I'm going to care for him and his mother. I'm going to make him even a great nation. Now, it's going to be much to your, to your uh, uh, challenges, much to your uh, difficulty as we move forward because they exist but I'm going to care for them. I'm going to provide for them. Even though conflict between those descendants persists even today. We're talking and we're praying about the war that's going on in the Middle East right now. And it's all a result of this conflict between these two groups of people. Resulting from these two half-brothers. But it would have been so much worse and detrimental to the cause of God had they not gone through this time of separation. So there's no pushback from Abraham. Maybe he's growing. Maybe he's learning. He doesn't fight for it. He trusts God. Even though he wants to control the situation, he understands that God knows what's best. And so he leans into it. Now, when I was reading this passage, I have to admit, I was a little bit concerned about Abraham's gesture here. Hagar and Ishmael are getting ready to leave. And what does he do? He gives them a canteen full of water and a loaf of bread. And I'm thinking, that doesn't sound like Abraham. That doesn't sound like a man of generosity, a man who's got this great blessing upon his life, a man who cares for these individuals who have been a part of his life. And so I was a little bit hard on Abraham. I'm going, what is, what's going on here? And then it finally settled into my heart and I began to think about it. And I said, I think Abraham is demonstrating a real trust in God, isn't he? He's taking God at his word. God said, I will care for them. You don't have to worry about this. I've got it. And so Abraham says, I would give you more, but what I give you are pauper's rations. God's going to provide for you. He's got great blessing in store for you. And he leaned into the assurance of that promise. The same promise that he given to Abraham and Sarah. The same character 
at the core of this promise. So Ishmael will be blessed, though the blessing is going to be different. He's going to receive earthly blessings, while Isaac is receiving heavenly blessings. Hagar got him a wife from Egypt, and he had many children. He lived free in the desert, prospering, but he's also a mocker of God's promise, while Isaac was destined for glory, a city not made by hands. So we see that God takes the internal problem and removes it from among them. The third thing we see here are the external pressures that they face and how those are settled. External pressures are settled. Abraham had a mixed testimony with Abimelech. We saw that last week, right? We saw once again that Abraham stumbled and fumbled and bumbled his way into trying to figure out things in his own strength rather than trusting God. His previous interactions did not go well, and it ended up being a poor witness for God. But that's changed. Something has changed dramatically here. Abimelech and Fickle have seen a difference. They've observed a difference. It says their testimony, what they have observed in Abraham and his family, is that God is with you in all that you do. God is with you in all that you do. Now, herein is a challenge for us as God's people. How God works in us for his glory, and for the advancement of his kingdom. When he has a people that will trust him and take him at his word and obey him and follow him as Abraham has learned to do, then God exalts his own name for others to see. And what do they do? They come to Abraham and said, you know, God's really done some amazing things for you. We would like to get in on this. We'd like to hear more about this. We would like to come into covenant with you and experience this for ourselves. This is the way, this is why your testimony for Christ is so important in everyday life. You never know who's watching and observing. And they recognize that you're distinct from the world. You're different from the world. You think differently. You behave differently. You have different affections than the rest of the world. And God uses that to prick their conscience, to draw them unto them himself through you, through what they see and observe. His glory operating in and through your life. So they want an agreement. They want a treaty with Abraham and with his God. Now, anytime you have powerful leaders, prosperous uh, portfolios and limited space, you're going to have conflict at some, some place, some time. They're going to find out that they have areas, the wind changes, and they begin to distrust one another. So these alliances were important for them to coexist. And stresses were already beginning to happen between Abraham and Abimelech, much like they did with Lot and Abraham. He had dug a well. After this covenant appeal, he takes Abimelech aside and he says, you know, it's interesting that you're pressing for this, but let me say, as long as we continue to have these issues between us, it's going to be hard to sustain the covenant. Well, what do you mean by that, Abraham? Well, let me just tell you, you know, I dug a well here. You told me to live in your land. You told me to live here as though it were mine and to make myself at home. And so I did. I dug a well. And what happened? Your servants came in and in hostile fashion took it away from us. And they're claiming that it belongs to them, that they dug it. So they spar a little bit here. Abimelech is clearly defensive. He offers three excuses. He says, I didn't know. (laughs) It's not my fault. I didn't know what was going on. He says, you didn't tell me. So it's not my fault. And this is the first I'm learning about this. You can't hold me responsible for something I didn't know about. Which I'm a little bit thinking maybe he's stretching things a little bit, don't you think? Stretching this out. So at any rate, they clear the air and they form this covenant. 
God's promise to Abraham had been twofold, right? A land and an heir. A land and an heir. It's tempting. It's very tempting here to think that after 25 years, all that Abraham's been through, all the struggle that he's had, and finally, finally, Isaac arrives. That, hey, it's done. It's over. It's completed. I can put my feet up and relax and enjoy. God has fulfilled the promise, and it's all done. And while Isaac, the promised son, has arrived, these three stories remind us that the promise has a better fulfillment. This is not the final, the ultimate fulfillment. There's a better fulfillment that's coming. This is only pointing forward to the ultimate fulfillment. God's not finished. The plan is not complete. In fact, he's actually just getting started. Isaac is but a foreshadowing of the true heir, the last Adam, Christ, Christ himself. The promises are not all complete in Isaac, but they will and are all complete in Christ. There's still conflict. There's still stresses. There's still brokenness. The promises to Abraham have more in store than just a physical heir and land. This brings us to the final thing I want to point to you this morning, and that is the tamarisk tree that is planted. The tamarisk tree that is planted. It's kind of almost like an afterthought, isn't it? But after all these things, Abraham plants a tamarisk tree. What is a tamarisk tree? Well, it's native to the Middle East. It's native to northern Africa, to those dry, arid climates. It's brittle, has feathery branches. It has little scale-like leaves adorning those branches. And these trees are able to flourish in salty soil that's uninhabitable for much ordinary vegetation. And it grows very slowly, maybe an inch a year. Now, those of you that, like Craig, like myself, that really love to have to trim hedges all the time, you know, that seem like when you get to the summer, they grow an inch every week. A tree that grows an inch over a period of a year. Now, I'm thinking a couple of things here are at stake. He planted this slow-growing tree in a land, in a place where he's an alien. It's not his land. It's not his land. Robert, if I came to your house tomorrow and planted a tree out there in the front yard, you know, dug a big hole and planted a tree, you and Susan would probably be a little bit cross with me, wouldn't you? You'd probably smile. You're nice people. You'd probably smile and say, isn't that nice? And go behind closed doors and say, what was he thinking? Why is he planting a tree in our yard? Look, if you want to plant a tree, go plant a tree on your property. So here's Abram. He's planting a tree in a land that doesn't belong to him. He's planting a tree that has a slow-growing future. It's not even useful at this point. What's he doing? He's pointing ahead. He believes, he believes that God's promises can be trusted. God's promised him this land. It's not his by deed right now, but it is his by promise. And he plants this tree that's not going to do him any good at 100 years of age. He's planting this tree for future generations to enjoy. This is a man that now believes the word of God can be trusted. No matter how absurd it may sound to our ears, this God can be trusted As Moses wrote this, I think he must have been laughing out loud. He's writing this, and the whole time he's writing this, as God's giving him this revelation of himself, he's thinking about the hardships and the difficulties and the disobedience that has faced Israel since they've come out of Egypt. 
They tried to mutiny against him. They murmured against him. They complained about food and water. They whined and they pined for the days of captivity in Egypt. They preferred captivity without God over the wilderness with God. God kept telling them, trust me, I've got this. Trust me, there's a land, there's a place where we will dwell together, where the milk and honey flow. Moses was laughing. (laughs) He was laughing at God's goodness and faithfulness. 25 years, Abraham and Sarah waited. They struggled, they stumbled, they doubted, they labored. Isaac's birth was the most incredible moment they'd ever known. Relief, disbelief, unbridled joy. It actually happened, just like God said it would. Exactly when God said it would happen. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree and called on the name of the Lord. He worshiped God. This is the right response when God reveals his goodness and his glory, which for you and I is every day, isn't it? His faithfulness is on display every day. He is the everlasting God, the eternal God. His faithfulness is too wonderful to contain. It's too wonderful to keep to yourself. Seeing it, experiencing it, causes great joy. I take particular interest in this tamarisk tree. I had a little sapling off of one of my crepe myrtles that showed up at the bottom of its parent, I guess, a few years ago, and I pulled it up gingerly, carefully by the root, and I took it and I transplanted it somewhere else on my property. And I watch it. It's not growing fast enough. I want it to grow faster. There's something about tree life. There's something about the tree. Some grow fast and some grow slow. The ones who grow fast are brittle and they're prone to damage and death and disease. Seems like those that grow slowly are more dependable. But I think a lot about trees and I'm thinking about a tree that existed in a place that God made called Eden. And it was there at that tree that Adam and Eve sinned before God and they brought all of this death and destruction and despair and disobedience into this world that God had made. But God gave them an amazing promise. He said, I'm going to send a redeemer, one who will pay the price for sin and secure everlasting life for sinners. His name was not to be Isaac. His name was to be Jesus. Isaac would factor into that, part of the family tree, part of the line from which the line of Judah would come. His conception and birth would be more miraculous than Isaac's. To a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, the word says. And at his birth, all heaven exploded in expectation and joy and praise. And he lived a sinless life, always doing what the Father pleased, always doing what honored God. And then, in an incredible way, God the Father planted another tree just outside of Jerusalem. And it was on that tree that life didn't spring forth, but death. The death occurred. The Son of God was crucified on that tree in the place of sinners like you and me. And all heaven gasped and mourned the day he died. God's justice, God's wrath, Scripture says, were propitiated. And redemption was accomplished. And on the third day, he arose He came up from the dead, and all who believe his gospel and turn from sin can be forgiven of sin and given this incredible gift of everlasting life in the presence of the everlasting God. God's faithfulness demands that we rejoice. 
But there's another tree. There's another tree. Listen. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of that river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. All who believe this gospel are forgiven of sin. They find blessing and eternal life there in God's eternal presence. It's evidence. It's proof that God's faithfulness is always to his promises. This broken world is not our destination. Wars, rumors of wars, conflict, Murder, violence, this is not our home. We're headed for the true promised land, the true promised land where God dwells in peace and glory forever. He is everlasting God. He is most high God, Savior, Lord, and Master without end. There we abide under the branches of that tree of life and experience the healing that only God can give. Can you rejoice in the Lord's faithfulness? Indeed, we can and we should. Father, thank you for your glorious grace. Lord, for your care of us, for your promises to us. And to know that those promises, the answers to each and every one is yes in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that on this day, we will be mindful of those promises, promises to save, to secure, to heal, to bring peace that is beyond anything this world can imagine. And that those promises, Lord, those promises are immense and they are eternal and they are subject only to your power and your spirit. Lord, work in us, work through us that your promises may Shine forth that others will be drawn to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.